So there's a misconception that if you're single, you are incomplete, perhaps damaged, salvaged, and you won't be happy until you find your one. And that is not true. That is bullshit. It is a message that has been fed to us by media and advertising. The truth is, when you're single, you have the richest soil for growth. That's why I created this podcast. And unlike other podcasts, this one is host-driven, not guest-driven. That means I will be rotating health and wellness experts three times a week to give you the giant box of wellness crayons, not just the primary colors, so you can start building a meaningful life. It's time to give singlehood a cape. I am super excited to introduce you to today's host. Her content is super potent, and that's where I found her on social media. Her name is Sarah Baldwin, and she is a somatic experiencing practitioner and trauma coach who is trained in polyvagal interventions to support nervous system regulation and is on the polyvagal training team. Now, she specializes in somatic trauma, trauma healing, somatic attachment work, parts and inner child work, and nervous system regulation. I know there's a lot of big words here, but what's amazing about her is she takes all this dense, complicated stuff and brings it to street level. And everything that she talks about is very applicable, meaning that she gives you homework. She tells you um, how to work through this in simple steps. And she believes, and science confirms, that we are completely unbroken and that Healing is our birthright. Our systems just need to be spoken in a way that they understand. And when that happens, everything changes. Sarah can be found on Instagram at Sarah, S-A-R-A-H-B, coaching. Enjoy Sarah Baldwin. Sarah, first, I just want to say uh, thank you for being a part of this collective. One of the reasons why I reached out to you was because Uh, I think your content is so potent and I feel like uh, the the nervous system and all the stuff that you, you, you talk about, you kind of bring it back to that. And I feel like it's uh, you know, it's, it's stuff that we should have learned uh, in high school. You know, I also love that at the end of your videos um, you're not just giving information, but you're also giving a lot of how to's, right? So what do we do with this? Um, So yeah, I, 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 I love your content and I thought it would be, a gift to share it um, in audio format via podcast. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, it's, I, I love collaborating with folks and it's just such an honor to be a part of the collective and to be serving this community and each person that's listening now. So, so thank you so much for having me. And I really join you in um, feeling deeply that this work Really, I believe should be in every elementary school. It should be in yeah. every place of government. Oh, you, you you think further back? You think elementary? I, think, I, <laughs> I was think thinking we high school. Starting this very very young. It's yeah. so interesting to me that we learn how to make dioramas and we learn about cumulus clouds and we learn trigonometry and geometry. Yeah. And not that those things are not important, but nobody teaches us about the vehicle we inhabit and how right. to actually be in the driver's seat of it. And so as a result, everybody's just kind of doing their best. Um, yes. We're at, the, we're at the mercy of external circumstances, patterns we don't really understand. And what occurs is this brilliant that, you know, we can chat about a bit maybe today or certainly I'll have episodes on it, but this brilliant autonomic nervous system, which I call mm-hmm. our protective nervous system, mm-hmm. if we aren't in the driver's seat. It's sort of like, so if we are a vehicle, there's a driver's seat of the vehicle. When our system thinks we aren't safe, it kind of like it shoots us into the back seat and then mm-hmm. it goes on autopilot and it takes over. Yes. And so choices that we make in life, the behaviors we we have, but really our, our, our truly our entire experience is going to be indicative of what's happening in our nervous system. So yeah, I, join yes. I wish I had it as a kid uh, myself. I agree. Me too. And and I got to say, um, because no child enters adulthood unscarred because there is trauma and, you know, um, we fall into uh, fight or flight states. Uh, we are in unsafe environments as we grow up um, because that's just part of life. Uh, this is foundational. You know, this language and what you're talking about is it's not like for a select few. It's for the masses. So let's put a bookmark there and tell me, um, 
tell me about your childhood and how you grew up. And uh, I want to eventually get to what uh, led you to 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 gravitate toward this. Um, I, I I'm assuming that somewhere in there, uh, Peter Le- Levine in that uh, book, uh, the, the Body Keeps the Score, has <laughs> has um, you know and it made some kind of impact on you. Um, but yeah, let's let's start from um, early on, and you could go back as far as you want. So, uh, you know, like so many people are oftentimes our purpose, uh, wherever our purpose is, lies our biggest work in our lives. And so for me, I grew up uh, with a, um, a quite extreme complex trauma history. I mm. was uh, sexually abused inside my home, raped for mm. 10 years or so. Um, this is early years. childhood? Yeah, yeah. This was yeah. This was beginning in elementary school oh. um, uh, and severe neglect. And uh, mm. there was eight kids, but really everyone was raising themselves poverty. And, and wow. Uh, eight kids. You're one of eight. I'm one of eight. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, it was, uh, there's uh, my mother had eight children, mm-hmm. multiple different um, men, mm-hmm. but we all grew up in the same house together. Um, but uh yeah, extraordinary um, uh, experiences of, of uh, pretty extreme trauma or very sure. extreme trauma. And yeah. so as a result of that, I uh, I couldn't learn, you know, fully. Meaning, mm. and, and what I mean by that is when we, when we experience trauma of any kind, but certainly the kind of trauma I just described, our thinking brain, our prefrontal cortex, where we can can read something and comprehend it, where we can mm-hmm. we can intake information, it shuts off, which is a brilliant survival response. So kids aren't able to learn if they are experiencing continual um, uh, forms of trauma. Oh, My interesting. System, right? Yeah, and so this perpetuates a problem, right? Because kids right. in school then. Uh, get the message that they're not good. There's something wrong with them. They're not smart. Mm. When in fact, what's really transpiring oftentimes is their system is dysregulated. It's not possible for them to learn fully. Wait, so is uh, it, it, is the learning part of the brain shut off? So everything could, um, all the energy can go into the protection of self and that's fight right. or flight, right? The it's, focus changes. It, it, that's right. It, you know, this is the, when I was a child and into being a young adult and uh, all along the way, no one was telling me what was happening inside of my system. Right. Right. And one of the biggest things about trauma is it's not just the actual event. It's the aftermath of the event and what transpires. Mm, and, the ripple. Yeah. And, and so the beautiful thing about how our systems work, Again, I didn't understand. I just thought I was broken. There was something wrong with me. Uh, It it could never change. But what's occurring when we experience trauma is that we have this threat detector. And its whole job, I'll just briefly mention this, is to to keep us safe and alive. It's looking Mm -hmm. out every millisecond. So it's like, that's pretty fast to say, is that safe, dangerous, or life-threatening? Those are the three Mm -hmm. choices it's saying. It's looking outside. Interoceptively, it's also looking inside. So if something is dangerous, then we go into our sympathetic nervous system. People have heard that referred to as fight or flight. Right. And when we're there, we think about if a lion is chasing me, I don't need to learn a new language or philosophize. I need to be able to get away. So our system says we don't need this thinking brain. It takes a lot of energy and blood flow mm-hmm. for the brain to function. Mm-hmm. Shut that down. We shut down our immune system, our GI tract, and so on and so forth. Now, if the lion is about to eat us, meaning we're about to, the, the impala is about to get eaten by the lion. That I think this is so beautiful. We all have something called a dorsal vagal complex, and this is mm-hmm. our state of shutdown. And our system w- goes here when we say, it's essentially saying, my darling, we can't get away from this thing and we can't make it stop. But what I can do is help you leave your body so you don't have to feel the pain of this. Oh, it's, like it's, we, it's beautiful, but it's also very sad. <laughs> It's, you know, it's sad that it's sad that living beings have to experience excruciating. Yeah, pain. yeah, right. And at the same time, when I learn the neuroscience behind that, and and I like to think I I kind of like um, put words to if our nervous system could talk. I feel like I'm advocating for it, but mm. when I think about our nervous system doing that, and we're mammals, every mammal has a system that does this. 
I think how how loving that is when humans have let us down, our nervous system never let us down. It never stops working. It will never stop fighting for us and protecting us. And so I found as a child, because of my trauma history, I couldn't get away from what was happening and I couldn't make it stop. Mm. So my nervous system came in and said, we can help you to not have to feel this or even be in your body and be present to it. And if I didn't find that, I for sure wouldn't be alive. I mean, I was still very suicidal in my early twenties, but I absolutely wouldn't wouldn't be here. It is. So, you, are you talking about way. like um, dissociating? Are you talking about kind mm-hmm. of um, yeah. uh, self protection yes. through yeah dissociating? Yeah, and there's many levels of our dorsal vagal complex. Like, it starts with apathy. I don't really care. Whatever. I feel mm-hmm. kind of like a funk, disconnected, uh, fuzzy, hopeless. I don't need energy. Everything seems so hard. Now I feel depressed. Mm-hmm. Now I start to feel like I'm not fully here, not in my body. There's levels of dissociation, right. which is, again, not an experience of not being in our bodies. I was highly dissociated, meaning um, I didn't remember most of my childhood at all. Yeah. Uh, and then in my 20s, I would look in the mirror and I wouldn't recognize who it was. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know if the world was real, if I was real. I would show up. I remember showing up to a therapist who wasn't a drama therapist. So funny when I think of this. It wasn't funny at all in the moment. But I showed up to this therapist's office and he, yeah, was, he didn't do trauma work. It shouldn't have taken out as a, as a client, but I got to sit down and he's like, how'd you get here today? And I said, I don't know. And he was scared. You can see in his wow, face. Like yeah, he was, of course. He was really scared. And he's like, what do you mean you don't know? And I said, I don't know. I just remember being in your waiting room, but I don't know how I got here. And that's just deep dissociation um, right. that I was experiencing. So dissociation has levels. You know, for for example, most of us, you, for anyone listening here, you ever drive to your house or walk to your house in your neighborhood? Mm-hmm. So like you're close by and you get home. And if I asked mm-hmm. you, how many stop signs did you go through? Or like, who do you, you're like, I don't know. I was thinking about the other thing. That's a, a mild dissociation. And I yeah, and also your 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 uh, subcon your subconscious is kind of driving. You you could be thinking about groceries, and you're you're automatically driving because of your subconscious taking you right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So that um that was a lot of that was you know painted the picture of my childhood experience. Um, I wait. Can I ask you a question? So in your twenties, mm-hmm. um, were you? So I worked in nonprofit for five years uh, in addiction yeah. and um, the girls, three out of five, you know, heavy trauma, um, uh, sexual abuse yeah. and all that. And they tend to go one way or the other. So in your 20s, did you then become kind of crazy and wild and like, or did you, you know, go the other way, which is, yeah. you know, uh, depression, yeah. sexual exclusion? Mm-hmm. Well, so in uh, high school, and I just think it's it's so amazing how our systems find a way to make it through things that are unbearable and unspeakable. And what, and if for anyone listening, I don't want you to think like, well, I didn't have that kind of history. So is my experience still unbearable? Of course, because mm-hmm. it's all very relative. Um, but what I found, what I learned, which I was totally subconscious is if I did, just am not in this house, I'll be a little bit safer. So what I learned to do and learned as a young kid in elementary school, like there was no, I taught how to teach myself to read. There was no one helping me. It was just me mm-hmm. on my own doing everything. But I learned if I can do the very best I can possibly do, I can get love from these teachers mm-hmm. and I can also be in this house less. So the interesting thing is I use two parts of my nervous system, one that shut down state when I was home and then this hypermobilizing state called our sympathetic nervous system of do, 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 do. So I achievement, good grades, that kind of stuff. Achievement. That's right. I joined every club you could possibly join. Mm -hmm. I was a president of everything, all of which, because then, then I wasn't home till 9 PM every day and I was safe at school. So that followed me into college. Um, But then once I got to college, I, I went to college in Boston and when you oftentimes when you leave unsafe environments, then your psyche says, oh, it might be safe for us to begin processing this. And so mm-hmm. what happened to me was, um, well, it's a culmination, but I, I had to take private loans out for college. 
um, uh, because again, I didn't, we, I, we, I grew up in poverty and um, my stepfather, who was the one that abused me, uh, forged my signatures. He was my co-signer and he forged my signatures on all these um, loans and uh, took the money. And, oh, you know, man. I had no one to help me. There was nobody like I could call to say, hey, could you help me? Um, and, and that was when, you know, things began to arise for me, um, yeah. more fully, uh, or, or yeah, things began to show up more. I mean, I had to work full time while in college to try to mm -hmm. like be able to stay. Um, and then I, I started to feel what I go into pretty deep depressions. I mean, I gained 75 pounds in, um, two months, maybe. Wow. Um, I was did you, not did you have friends or were you kind of introverted I and alone, did, but I had a lot of trauma bonded friends, you know, people mm -hmm. who were also get very, um, were around, but, but weren't in health themselves. So, right. but there was, yeah, there was just no one, there was no one to call, you know, mm -hmm. um, it was really hard and I, and I did turn to, so in, in college, and in high school, I was disconnected from the abuse that happened. I did always mm -hmm. have a sense that I was abused. And I would say that to my uh, mother and my stepfather, which is so fascinating, right? I was so dissociated. I didn't know it was him. So I would say to them, I think I was abused. And they would say, oh, everyone feels that way. Just don't tell anyone that. It's very common. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's not, of course, that's not true. But whatever kids hear, whatever you're told as a child, you just think that must be what everyone else experiences. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I, um, I experienced a lot of depression in college, uh, and, and, and suicidal ideation. And, and then, um, but I was, but was promiscuous. The thing is I would, the, the way that I experienced my sexuality was I had to not be present for it. So, you know, drinking, right. uh, yeah. a lot in order to experience Nothing. it numbing, uh, risky behaviors, um, that happened for sure in my twenties. Um, can I ask you something? 20s. Um, because this is also a uh, very, very common as well. Uh, do, what were you give? I mean, not just you, but anyone, um, who has followed this pattern, yeah. uh, what do they get out of the, um, sexual exploration promiscuity? Is it the attention and, validation or is it dopamine? What is it? Why do people yeah. tend to go that way if they uh, have been sexually abused? It's, uh, two, two primary reasons. Number one, uh, if, if someone has experienced, especially if you, if you were abused, um, by people who are supposed to love you, the, mm -hmm. what occurs is now our system says, this is what love is. And this is my value. This is the way that I'm loved. So instead mm. of actually being embodied in someone's sexual experience, it's a way to achieve connection, love in connection, even right. there's though, an exchange. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And, and, but it is certainly not, um, for my own pleasure or experience. Right, right, right. You're it's, saying that I, I, I will give you me in exchange. Yes. I, I will feel loved. I will feel, you know, attractive, yes. valuable and all that. Right. Yeah, and then, exactly. then you, that so, you want more and more of that. Right. Yes, that's a part of it. The second thing is um, the the interesting thing about our systems is when we experience trauma, the beautiful thing about them, they're always trying to complete the experience. And by complete the experience, that means mm -hmm. make it different, mm -hmm. make it different. In this experience, maybe I get to have power instead of being powerless. In this oh, interesting. Right. I can be the one that's in control instead of being controlled. So, so there's a part of you that's re trying to rewrite this experience. That's right. That's that's yeah. exactly right. So that's another another reason that it um, that, that that transpires. The interesting thing is though that the way that threat detector I mentioned work neuroception it's located in our brainstem. Uh, it's a lo always looking into the world. What does this remind me of? What does this remind me of? to decide mm -hmm. if we're safe at any given moment. And it has kind of like a database of information. That's all your life experiences that it looks to, to decide if your current situation is safe, dangerous, or life-threatening. So the interesting thing is, remember, I was abused inside of my home. So right. what my system in, in my database says is, mm, 
If someone gets close to you like family, that's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Now, my nervous system said this receptacle said strangers. I wasn't abused by strangers. Strangers are nice. Strangers aren't bad. Strangers oh, are safe. interesting. So yeah. in my dating world, when I would date someone and I didn't really know them well, I felt much safer, much safer mm -hmm. to be fully more, not fully, right. definitely wasn't fully embodied, but more embodied, et cetera. Now, if I started to date someone, it's been six months, it's been a year. Now we're talking about moving in together, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, what occurred was my, my threat detector said, whoa, you're living with this person. Holy shit. They are. They start to feel like family. They start to feel like family. Yeah. And all of a sudden, what would occur, this really kind, wonderful person, let's say, uh, what would transpire is all of a sudden, my system would say, absolutely not. You are not getting anywhere mm -hmm. near her. Mm -hmm. And my, I was completely disconnected from my sexuality. I had zero desire for sexual intimacy or experience at all whatsoever. And I wouldn't let that person close to me. And I couldn't understand because no one was mm -hmm. telling me what was, why it was happening. I couldn't understand this pattern. I didn't know how to change it. I saw lots of therapists who didn't explain that to me and why it was happening. And it was so incredibly confusing to not understand mm -hmm. what was going on inside of me. I want to put a period here and I want to take a beat because you just shed light on something that uh, I've never heard in this way before. Now, as a therapist mm -hmm. and someone who's worked, you know, from eating disorders to addiction, um, of course, the pattern is there. And I, I, I know this pattern, but what you just said about abuse at home and then finding safety in strangers because home wasn't safe. And then if you actually decide to start building a relationship, now that smells like home. So now it's unsafe. Um, I've never heard that. And so uh, I think also people listening, there, 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 there may be many aha connect the dot type of moments right now as you're saying this. Mm, I hope, I deeply hope there are. Yeah. Uh, I, something I say all the time to people, and really I'm, I started by saying this to this young part of me as you make sense. You make sense. Everything about us makes sense. Every sure. single thing. Sure. About us. And for most of us, we felt like we haven't made sense. We're mm -hmm. like, what the hell is happening? I don't, I don't get this. Why is this pattern occurring? And when it comes to, you know, uh, something called polyvagal theory and, and the latest neuroscience research, and by latest, I mean like 20 years ago, um, it shows us this, which is so fascinating. And mm. so I think cool that our systems are able to, to do whatever it takes to keep us safe from what they think is going to be dangerous. Even if it's not, they think it, it has enough flavoring. Like, like you said, home, there's enough flavoring there of similarity where our system says, no, not safe. You know, the same goes for, I mean, just another example, like let's say someone's listening who wants to step towards your purpose. Your purpose requires being seen in the world and mm -hmm. your receptacle of information says being seen means you're going to be humiliated harmed, hurt. Well, guess what happens? Our, our protective system says, we're not stepping into the world. It's not safe for you to step in that purpose. Because look what happens when you're seen and right. your nervous system stops us. So, yeah. So how did you, at, once you had that revelation and you realized that um, you're not able to um, swim past the, the breakers of a relationship because it goes from feeling safe to unsafe, uh, what was the execution piece from there? What was your own prescription when you realized that about self? Well, I, I, so to give a bit more information, I, I moved to, I got off the plane in Los Angeles with two suitcases and nowhere to sleep, like no adult, oh, wow. hundred thousand dollars in debt. Cause the money that was stolen from me. Yeah. I had nowhere to go. And how old were you? 20, just about to be 22. Oh my gosh, baby. And, and also why, why Los Angeles? Why'd you leave Boston? I went to a uh, school for theater. It was my first degree. Okay. Uh, in yep. Boston, yep. A school called Emerson and they have a, a Oh yeah, I know Emerson. Semester. Yeah. You could do your last yeah, semester yeah. in LA. So I did that and, and I liked it. And I, well, I always had this knowingness, like my intuition was telling me like, I'm going to live there and I had no home, you know? So it was, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. When I think of that though, like, wow, to get off a plane and nowhere to sleep, I slept on a friend's floor with cockroaches in their, in their uh, kitchen. 
right, for right. like a few months. And then I lived on, a, I shared a twin, twin air mattress for a full year with a friend, which is wow. a weird thing to share a twin air mattress. But, uh, Wait, yeah, we're I'm we're in Los Angeles because I, I I grew up here and I'm always um uh, th- again. By the way, this story very common, right? People coming to LA, LA yeah. feels very shiny. It's very exciting. Of course, the beach, yeah. the mountains, all of that. Um, where yeah. in Los Angeles did you did you start? What city? I lived in West Hollywood, the friend's place that I was living. Oh, okay. in West Hollywood. I went. Well, at least the area is nice. Yeah. The area was nice. I didn't tell you the place we were staying was not so nice. Then sure. uh, three friends, we shared a place at Park La Brea, but, but I shared a room with another person with one air mattress and we couldn't, we didn't have like even a bureau to put clothes in. We just, mm. put it, on the ground. it was, it was really like sardines. Nice. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. And I met uh, someone who was the absolute best choice. I, tr- really, it's remarkable. I was able to choose the person I did at that point in mm-hmm. my life, um, based on where I came from. But I met, uh, someone whom, um, really fit into my dynamic, but in a healthier way, meaning mm. he had all the needs and right. could not, didn't have the ability to empathize. And there was no room for me really. And <laughs> I was really good at being someone who had no needs and centered someone else and oh, took care of them in all ways. And right only allowed to have certain versions of myself, but I couldn't be angry. That wasn't okay. All of this mm-hmm. is very familiar to my childhood. So what happened, yes. the same way that that threat detector works, my system said, ah, oh, it's familiar. This is what love yeah. is. Yeah, right. It's so, most familiar. Yeah. And so he was not, a be- you know, when I say better, such a better choice. He was nothing like my mother or my stepfather in terms of mm-hmm. being dangerous or mm-hmm. unkind. But he had a lot of flavorings of them. So I got married to him uh, when mm-hmm. I was 25. I wow. was married for um, uh, a long time. Uh, and in that relationship, at first, it really worked. Mm-hmm. Like at the first first year and a half, I thought I was like so, in, if you ask me, I was so in love. Um, yeah, of course. Really, there was a trauma bond happening there and it was creating yep. safety for me. My system was so unsafe in the world. And then what happened around? Wait, wait, can you can you explain to um, anyone who doesn't know what a trauma bond is? I know this is a very uh, yeah. topical yeah, yeah. topical thing these yeah, days. Yeah. yeah. What is what exactly so, is a trauma bond? So essentially, what that means is, or the way that I that I think about um, how we come into relationship, I think about um, we each have this this play like script. Think of it like a theatrical play, and I got my play from my childhood, and. Mm-hmm. The play, let's say it's like Midsummer Night's Dream was my family play. And everyone, you're born and you get a role. You don't choose your role. You're just given the role. So you get a play and you get the Midsummer Night's Dream play and someone gets the role of the scapegoat. Here you go. Everything's going to be your fault. Here you go. You're the one that's going to get abused in the family system. Here, you're the one that has to get everything right. And if you get everything right, you receive love that way. You're going to take care of the adults. Okay, everybody, now that you have your role... You have to say your lines. And if everyone says their lines in the right order, the play works. Mm -hmm. So, and it might be a dysfunctional play, but it works. And what occurs is then I grow up and I've got my role. And I was like coming to Los Angeles with my play subconsciously. And my role in the play was I am the person who has no needs. I am the person who takes care of others. And I'm the person who, you know, is abused and takes everything on. So those are some like mm-hmm. basics of my, my character role. And so right. my, as I have this, this play and I'm looking out into the world as, with my role, I also have a role that needs to be filled, meaning someone I'm looking for that can balance out the role that I play. So I'm looking for, in essence, like some parts of my mother, let's say. So I have no needs. So I'm looking for someone who has all the needs. I'm also looking for someone who uh, can't see me fully, can't empathize with me, Mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And so my partner, he had his own play that he came from, and he had his own role in that play. Mm -hmm. And part of his role was you have to be, uh, you receive love if you're centered all the time, and it's all about you, and and, uh, your experience is the only experience. And so Mm -hmm. what is he looking for? He's not looking for somebody else who's going to do that same exact thing because those right. two roles won't go together. He's right. looking for somebody who is the 
the yin to his yang, right? And so am I. I'm looking for, I'm not looking for someone who's also invisible because then, then I'm going to have to be seen. So yeah. we're both, we both have these roles that comes from trauma, really. And mm-hmm. what we are looking for is someone to, to fill the other role that's familiar to us. Mm-hmm. And so you meet someone, this is the thing, you know, the classic thing people say, they just meet someone and it's been a week and they're like, I feel like I've known you my whole life. You're, you, how did I ever do life without you? It's been one month, right? Like, I, I feel like I know you so well. What they're, what we're really saying is, oh my gosh, you remind me so much of my caregivers. Mm-hmm. This is just like my childhood. I'm mm-hmm. back in it again. Even if it's, you know, still really exciting and wonderful. That's what's occurring. And so if we've had traumatic experience, like I just described with mine, I a trauma bond is I'm looking for someone else to fit into that dynamic, that relational dynamic that was traumatizing and not yes. supportive for me, but it's what I know. And we so you're, do you're this tracing the old. The That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And most folks in relationships are unknowingly doing that kind of thing because if we haven't if we haven't dealt with our own attachment and our mm-hmm. um and, and what i call internal co-regulation so so really giving ourselves a new childhood experience and repairing all of that what's going to happen is we're going to choose what's familiar and what we know and and that's exactly what i did in in my marriage that is uh, and- such a thorough um definition and description of, of, of trauma bond. So th- thank you for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, after a little while, like I mentioned earlier, so after he and I were living together, specifically after we got married, my system was like, Mm-mm, this is really bad. This is really mm-hmm. bad. This is mm-hmm. just like your childhood. And I was like, totally shut down. Uh, sexually i wanted like no emotional right. intimacy physical intimacy anything um wait is is that also um um you realizing wait a minute uh, in the beginning yes it was um hot and heavy and exciting and now i'm realizing this is bad is, is that also uh part of you evolving and growing kind of growing out of what you're used to not no? yet that not happened yet. later this okay. was just my pattern of they're yep. close now this reminds me of my childhood and then we were in that, I mean, we were in couples therapy for like nine years, so long. Wow. Um, and what occurred was he created enough safety for me that I, and was supportive of it, that I could finally find the healing support I needed and devote, mm. really, I devoted my life to it in so many ways. So I really ventured down my own healing journey. And what occurred was, I don't know how many years in, but. I started to have needs. I started to um, take up space. I started to not just be easygoing and okay with Mm -hmm. everything. Like, I'm just Mm -hmm. so easygoing. You know, like, we never went to a, literally, a restaurant that I liked for the whole, you know, for years and years and years. Because I was just so used to that dynamic. And then, it's so exciting when this happened. Then I wasn't. And then that, that, lioness within me that was not safe to come out in my childhood was now safe to come out. And this is like, that's like saying to someone else, Hey, to my partner, like I just, I've been healing and I wrote a new play. In fact, I hate that shitty play that I came from. I don't like my role yes. to play. I just yeah. wrote myself a new role. No longer do I not have needs. See, look, there's just a bunch of, bunch of needs mm-hmm. here now. Mm-hmm. Um, I need to take up space now. I actually have an opinion on things. And you know what? There's some things you do that I'm not okay with. I want to have a talk about that too. Uh, and so on and so forth. And I was like, here's my new role. Are you excited? I'm so excited. And what usually transpires, at least at first, is the other person is like, what the hell? What yeah, are you of doing? course. No, right. this isn't how we do this. This, is this, not is, this isn't what I signed up for. This is false advertising. This is confusing. Exactly. And basically, who are you? You know, exactly. Who are yeah. you? I don't like this. And, and yeah. my experience was, I don't like this version of you. Um, and, and it was, we spent a lot of time in this, in this battle sure. until, until I, I'm really stubborn until I realized or got to a place of, um, it's not possible inside this dynamic to, mm. to, to, for me to be fully me and for 
for both of us to grow together because both people really have to be doing the work in order for it to, to be long lasting and sustainable. And, and so, now you're what in your, are you in your thirties now? Are you, how old are you now? I'm 36. I'm 36. I mean, not, not um, today, but oh, in the, in this, this, uh, when you had this revelation, you realized it's not going to work. You're you're 36. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I don't know. Maybe 30. Late 20s. Or, uh, late Early 20s, 30s. I would say. Okay, late got 20s, it. Got late 20s. Yeah. Late 20s. And then, and then I was in the battle phase for a while. Yeah. Meaning like, oh, I need to take up, you know, like just why well, can't, like, I remember being, when I would be like gaslit out of things, I was like, or when I was angry and I was like, my reality is real. I remember saying that once, like, and I was angry and it felt so good to be able to finally mm. say that out loud, you mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so for me with that relationship ending, it was such a beautiful celebration of my, yeah. of my journey. And, and he and I are, you know, um, still, it, he feels like family to me. I, I feel deeply grateful for, I feel grateful that I was able to find someone whom was safe and whom was supportive of my own journey. And at the same time, it was such an important thing for that to come to an end. And I just want to name that because our culture, you know, there's still this thing out there, like that's a mm-hmm. failure if a relationship mm-hmm. ends. Sure. And in fact, oftentimes it can, it can be an incredible marker of our healing journey. Yeah, a absolutely. Thing for that to happen. Can we, can we pause there for a second? Cause now you're hitting something else that I think is so important. Um, speaking of, uh, and of course you don't have to be single to, um, get, you know, stuff from, from, from our, these podcasts, but if you are, um, yes, when, when you, when a relationship has expired or you have finally found a voice or, or you're able to stand on your truth, you're able to, um, tell yourself that you matter or you have needs or whatever. Um, it, it's also like lined with, well, if this relationship doesn't work out, there's failure, especially if you're married. Cause I, I'm also divorced. And I remember, mm-hmm. you know, uh, now there's a, a salvage stamped on my head and, you know, it's supposed to be divorced. And I thought it was happily ever after and what's wrong with me and all of that. Um, but you're saying that this is the act break in your life where you actually, um, the bib turned into a cape. I, I always talk mm-hmm. about how in my journey, I, um, I was, I was, I'm, you know, adult, adult child of an alcoholic and kind of had a, a bib, right? And also youngest sibling position. Um, I didn't, at 35, I didn't even know how to work the dishwasher. Um, but it was this moment for me too, where, uh, and I found myself through motorcycles, CrossFit and donuts. And that's when I turned my, my bib into a cape. It's when, um, after becoming a therapist saying, you know what? I don't want to wear um, dockers and uh, a tie. I, I want to actually help people at the park. I want to <laughs> ride, make house calls. Mm-hmm. And and I was on Tumblr at the time, but um, that's how this whole angry therapist started was uh, I want to have um, a practice that is honest to me and it felt very empowered. Mm-hmm. So it seems like uh, that's, this is that moment in your life where it became an act break. And if you're listening to this and you're feeling Oh, I can relate or resonate, or I think I'm around there. Know that it's a really empowering, um, but also terrifying place to be. Yeah, but exciting. And yeah. I and I also will say this. You know, I, I do a lot of somatic attachment work and somatic parts work, or people mm-hmm. may uh, you can think more like inner child work, parts work. Same same thing to me. But more often than not, so the reason I couldn't leave that relationship for so long even though I had lots of people saying to me and listeners probably have had this experience happen to some of you listening where you have loved ones and friends who are like, you deserve so much better. Why don't you just leave? Like you, you know, this person yeah, doesn't of deserve you and why, and, and there can be so much shame around, but I can't leave. And I want to explain just really quickly why we struggle to leave. And one of the primary reasons is because inside of our romantic partnerships is where our younger parts show up the most. And Mm -hmm. that's because the way this threat detector works that I mentioned, right? It's always looking to see what does this remind me of? So Mm -hmm. a romantic partnership is going to be most reminiscent of our earliest childhood experiences. The earliest childhood experiences are the people who are supposed to love us the most. They were our person, whether they were there for you or not, and so on and so forth. So when we get into relationships, 
our young Wait, I'm, I'm writing this down, by the way. I, wait, wait, real quick, I have to write this down. Uh, the earliest, uh, our romantic relationships um, draw out uh, our, our, our earliest parts. Say that again, the if, way you said it. If there is, if there's, could be one area where our young our young parts show up the most is it is our romantic partnerships and the mm-hmm. reason why the young parts show up the most in our romantic partnerships there's a specific reason and that is because it begins with that threat detector again it all really goes back to our nervous system but we have this threat detector and it's always saying what does this remind me of what does this remind me of and it has a database of information to look to so when we think of romantic partnerships there are a lot of flavorings that are reminiscent of connection in our earliest childhood experience, meaning mm-hmm. people in our earliest childhood experience, they were supposed to be our most important people, the center of our universe, the people who are supposed to love us the most, our primary person, whatever. If you think of romantic partnerships, in many ways, that's what those people are or are supposed to be. And so what occurs is our threat detector is like, whoa, this is a lot like childhood. What do we have on that? And it quickly says, Sarah, how did you have to behave in childhood in order to be loved, in order to be safe, in order to belong? That is the MO. That's the game plan. It worked because you're here and alive. So that's what we're going to do in this romantic partnership. And so what occurs is, and, and I'm sure listeners, some of you can relate to this. You're single and you're like, I've got this. I feel capable and able in life and feel really good maybe for most of the time. Then all of a sudden you get into a romantic partnership and you're like, what the fuck happened? I'm mm-hmm. out of control. I like, I don't I can't understand what's occurring. I feel unsafe. I feel incapable. I feel scared. What's happening? Well, what's happening is a young part of you is embodying your system. And it's, it's almost like we, the more I do trauma work, the more clear it is to me that time's not linear. We travel time all the time. Like we mm-hmm. travel back to time when we're triggered or activated. Sure. And we can travel yeah. to the future too. So. Anyway, a young part is present in our bodies. And so think of this. Let's say like whatever's happening in my romantic partnership, let's say it's triggering an eight-year-old part of me. That would be like my adult friend saying to me, Sarah, you're so amazing and all of these beautiful things. And why don't you just leave? You deserve better. Well, well, I'm eight years old. I'm eight years old. Where do you want me to go? I'm eight. I won't be safe in the world. I'm eight. I can't be alone. Mm-hmm. It's better mm-hmm. to be with this person and at least have connection and some semblance of safety than be eight years old and unsafe and all alone. And so one of the primary reasons that people struggle to leave is because of that, because these young parts of us are inhabiting our experience and running the show. And, you know, if we look at kids who are abused and take, taken out of a home and put into foster care, they want to go back to that home more often mm-hmm. than not, because mm-hmm. that's what they know. And so my, when I say it was a celebration, it's because when I could get to a place where I finally had given the young parts of me, the safety they had been looking for their entire lives, that I became the parent to these young parts. I was giving them their needs Mm -hmm. that now it was safe to leave because I was taking care of the adult Sarah. And And as a result of that, you know, what occurred when uh, in creating an internal secure attachment, meaning really we can imprint new childhood experiences where my system was no longer uh, relating to myself or others in the way that I was in the past. And so I remember when I left, it was so beautiful to be able to just love being with me, to Mm -hmm. not mean anyone Mm -hmm. else, to feel like, wow, this is so amazing to finally feel home. I was looking for the home my whole life. Yeah. This is where um, the cape comes in. This is when you realize that um, I don't, it's not about trusting other people. It's about me trusting myself. That's right. Yeah. In the beginning of that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I I think that what we want to look, look for if we're finding ourselves single and feeling like um, that, that um, uh, survival feeling of needing someone. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not going to be okay if I don't have this person. I'm not going to be complete if I don't have a person or I'm not, you know, things aren't going to be all right. I'm not going to be lovable if I don't have a person. We just want to get curious about that and not, not being, you know, reprimanded or unkind to ourselves, but be curious because what that is cluing into is there is a part of us that is, I think of this like, a young part is reaching up 
like somebody pick me up, somebody mm-hmm. pick me up so that I can feel safe. And the only person that can actually pick that part up in a way that creates lasting change is us. And when we pick that part up, everything changes. And so uh, otherwise what occurs is we're perpetually looking for someone else dating, like a- another person, another person, just save me from this mm-hmm. experience or pick me up so that I'm okay. And even if they do pick us up, it's never enough because the, that young part is looking for us all along. They've been looking for us. Yeah. Wow. So that seems like that connection to yourself, you realizing that um, you are your own safe tree. Yeah. That seemed yeah. like the beginning for you, right? From from then on, now on to your um, self-betterment journey, your hero's journey, you know, I'm sure, you know, digesting books and courses and just really getting thirsty about uh, all of that. Yeah. And I, and I was doing that work inside of my marriage, which is the only way that I could eventually leave, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. marriage is, is, um, because, or rather I started with talk therapy, which had a lot of value and it wasn't, it wasn't enough. I think it's so interesting. I think about this all the time that the world, the medical field, has many specialists, right? Like I have an optometrist, cardiologist. I mean, I right. don't have those things on a cardiologist, but if I needed one, I could go to one. Uh, I have a, a gastroenterologist and so on and so forth. You see a specialist based on what you need. Now, the overarching, I think the world of mental health is archaic in this way, that if you go into psychology today, you can usually find the predominant thing people or folks are going to find is psychodynamic or talk therapy, which mm-hmm. is great and wonderful. It's like mm-hmm. a great uh, cardiologist. The issue, though, is that it's one crayon. The only, that's right. It's not the <laughs> only treatment that's necessary for healing. Right. But but because the world of healing is the world doesn't under, know about it enough, and, and this mm-hmm. is the fault of a system, is that someone like me, before I started my healing journey, I just thought, well, this must be the thing that helps everything. And I had a lot of talk therapists who really should be saying, should have said to me, this is outside my expertise. Mm-hmm. We need, we, you need to go to an ophthalmologist. Right, so what would right. occur is I would go to like the best cardiologist and I would get great heart surgery and I would leave and say, but my eyes are still messed up. And they would say, oh, I don't know why, you know, we did the heart surgery went great. So mm-hmm. everything went really awesome. And so I left just feeling like, well, I just must be messed up because this isn't working. Mm-hmm. I can't tell you how many people would try to help me rationalize why I should not feel shame. And there was no amount of talking about me not feeling shame that actually made me not feel shame and, or talking about why I'm safe to not feel dissociated that actually stopped me from feeling dissociated. And this is mm-hmm. because the things I'm talking about are subcortical, meaning they live in our bodies. They don't live up in our cortical brain. And so there's so much benefit to doing cortical work or or talk therapy and something else is necessary. And that is somatic work. Somatic work is how we speak the language of what is happening below the brain. Yeah. That is not a verbal language. And for everyone listening, just to simplify this, if you've ever felt anxious and you've tried to tell yourself, you're like cusping on, uh Oh, am I going to have a panic attack? Feel anxious. And you tell yourself, like, just calm down. There's nothing to be anxious about. You're about to do this interview. You're about to do this thing. Like, chill out. You're totally fine. If you try to do that, you probably notice that at the very least, your anxiety doesn't get any better. And at the Mm -hmm. worst, it just increases. And that's because you're trying to speak a verbal language to a system that does not, can't hear a verbal language. So it's literally, it, it, it doesn't know that you're talking to it. And so on my journey, I was really lucky and I don't even remember exactly how I found somatic trauma healing mm-hmm. and that changed my whole life. It changed everything. It is the only reason I'm here for sure. So you and went from head to head, the body, right? You, um, so, the, so talk therapy can be very heady. Um, you're saying yes. somatic and dropping into your body, rewiring yourself, all that kind of work instead of just talking about your feelings. That's, that's right. So, you know, and I, and I give that analogy of like the medical system versus what's happening in mental health, because, uh, because it leaves people feeling shitty. Like there's something wrong with them when in fact, you right. just need right. different, different courses of action based yeah. on what we're experiencing. 
We needed to see a spe different specialist. And, and when that occurs, our system responds. And it doesn't take 10 years for that to transpire. And so I found somatic work. Um, it allowed me to free myself of the past, it allowed me to regulate my nervous system as someone who was, I mean, I had so much chronic illness. I was bedridden, so depressed, suicidal, mm -hmm. just not how you see me now. And I think that's important because I know when I was on my journey, I would hear people talk and like, oh man, but I'll never get there. Like, I'm so, you know, it's not possible for me. And so I just want listeners to know that if you're feeling dysregulated, anxious, frustrated, shut down, burnt out, can't slow down, apathetic, hopeless, frozen, et cetera, all those things that are stuck in the past, that what I'm telling you, there's nothing, there is nothing special about my nervous system. It's so ordinary. It's just really run of the mill. And if, if that's possible for me, it's possible for each of us. I mean, on the ACEs study, um, adverse childhood experiences of trauma, I score so high. I mean, the, on that, that ACE study, ACEs study, I should not be here for all, for all. Mm, kinds of yeah. And the, the reason I'm so passionate about this work is because I believe these studies are faulty. The reason I'm saying that is because I deeply believe when our systems get what they need to come into healing, they do, they respond. And our systems know how to come back into homeostasis. Mm -hmm. They know how to come into healing. They're incredibly intelligent. They just need to be spoken to in a way they understand. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, it's just a really important message that I want to make sure listeners know that there's hope yeah. that it's possible. And science says that too. Thank you for that. And uh, when you were saying, you know, there is no one doctor that um, yeah. is a is a fits all blanket, right? There's these specialists. And um, this is why when I said to myself, okay, I want to really give singlehood a cape. I want to help people who are going through this journey which um the world has has you know labeled as uh incomplete you're not happy until you find the one all that stuff uh and of course you know you throw in the ticking clock and all that um and then you layer it with toxic uh swipe culture and dick pics and yep. catfishing and all the stuff that's happening totally. um i said to myself uh i i need the avengers i don't just need i just i don't want to be the only one talking because i'm only one person with one story through one lens and so that's why I have uh, Sarah Baldwin and I have another person who um, does the episodes on top of a mountain and during ice baths and, you know, and, and yeah, it's a, so the collective. Cool. Right. And so hopefully um, that's my way of um, saying that, uh, yeah, it's not a one fits all wherever you're going through. And so, yeah, thank I you so for, really yeah. About what Th you're doing, John, because it's so, it's so important. And, and not only, are there different modalities so important, but there'll be certain people that are more resonant for each of us too, you mm -hmm. know, and that's not a bad thing. That's a beautiful thing. And being able, you creating this collective and, and allowing this audience to be able to have those different flavorings is really such a gift. So thank you for letting me be a part of it. Yeah. Thank you for I, I, your stuff is so, I think it's going to um, land uh, uh, so well with people. So it's going to give them a lot of revelations. It's, it's, uh, it's gold. Where can we find you? Um, what are you up to now, right? What are some of your, your goals in, in your practice? So uh, first, where can we find you mm. uh, on you social can media? At SarahBaldwinCoaching.com or on Instagram. I give lots of free stuff mm -hmm. away and lots of free teachings. Uh, my handle is Sarah B, with Sarah with an H, B Coaching. Um, mm -hmm. I also have some, some free resources. Uh, for folks. So if you're just beginning and you're like, what is the nervous system and what does this even mean? And yeah, I have anxiety, but I'm not sure. Like, what do you, what does that all mean? Uh, I have a free quiz and I created this quiz and you can, you can check out my Instagram and uh, take it. I created it because as I mentioned, I believe this should be in every school. Like, we should mm -hmm. be able to understand our system. So when you take this quiz, there's different parts of our nervous system and it's going to clue you into which it's called a state, which state you hang out in the most, which one's most familiar to you. And there are specific things we do to regulate our nervous system based on the state we are in. So mm. um, that's completely free. There's a free workbook on trauma and your nervous system there as well. Um, and then I have courses and programs that are offered um, throughout the year. The next one will be happening in this one just started. The next one will happen in January called navigating your nervous system. Nice. Uh, 
and I'm writing a book for everybody at the moment. Oh, you're so, writing a book. What yeah, is the book called? Yeah. Do you have a title yet? Uh, it'll like, well, a working title is You Make Sense. We'll see what happens. But it's mm. really a holistic understanding of um, of this vehicle we inhabit and how to be in mm -hmm. charge of it so that we can we can change our lives. And I'm hoping to get it um, to get it also made into a to a young adult uh, or or a book for teens too. So oh, nice! Can, yeah, can be in schools and stuff. So, yeah, I love it. Thank you for um, all the work that you're doing, and thank you for being a part of this team. I'm super excited to see. Um, all the other uh, audio podcasts that you're going to be contributing to this collective. And uh, yeah. And also thank you for um, being so transparent uh, and honest with your story. You know, um, you shared a lot of personal things and I, um, I don't want to minimize how hard that is for one to share one story. Mm, oh, thank you. Thank First of all, thank you so much for having me uh, for all the listeners here. I'm so excited to bring this work to you and spend some time with you. And uh, you know, Trauma feeds on silence and mm -hmm. shame feeds on silence. So it feels, yep. it is such an honor for me to be able to share uh, part of my story with everyone here. And if any part of it, inclination, res you know, was, was resonant for you, uh, just a reminder that you're not alone and that things. Yeah. Change. Thank you for so that. You. And finally, early on in the conversation, um, you said something, I copied it and I'm now going to paste it as the title uh, with your approval. And so you said, uh, if your nervous system could talk. And I remember thinking, okay, that's the title for this episode. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. You know, it's cool when you're talking, you don't realize the things you say. I love that. If your nervous system could talk, that's great. You know, I, I, uh, I see words cause I'm also a writer and, um, uh -huh. when people, and I'm like this in session, when people are talking, um, I try to get out of my own way and something will light up words will light up in neon, like a visual, I will just see it. Oh, cool. And then, I will know that that means something and I'll, I'll use it in the session or put it in my back pocket. And so, uh, that's I how, that. uh, that's what happened here. Oh, I love that. Thank you for, for sharing a bit of your process too. I'm going to take that with me and, um, and thank you for your time. Yeah. All right. Everyone listening, be well. I hope that episode was helpful. Hey, listen, if you want to share your singlehood journey, if you've gone somewhere, come back. If you have revelations and wisdom, please share your story. It's going to help other people. Nothing makes us feel more connected than hearing other people's stories. So just send me the audio of your story and you can just record it directly from your phone and email it to theangrytherapist at gmail.com. Also, if you want our Single on Purpose newsletter, go to singleonpurpose.life. That's singleonpurpose.life. You will get tools and articles and other people's stories and also uh, zoom links to private gathers so if you want to join our community go to singleonpurpose.life thank you for listening be well we hope you tell a friend hello my name is michelle and this is my singlehood story um, which i consider to be a work in progress um, i've been single now for two years i was in a marriage for a long time um, I live abroad because my, my ex was from here. I'm 52 years old and I've known him for almost 30 years and I was married to him for over 20 years or I was with him for over 20 years. And we went through an incredibly devastating separation in 2020, um, at the height of COVID, which was very bad where we live. And we had incredibly strict lockdowns and restrictions here. So it was horrible timing because all of the advice that you'd normally be given during a divorce, um, I couldn't follow up on. I couldn't, I couldn't even leave my house to take a walk. I needed a permission slip to, to go to the grocery. I mean, permission slip from the police to go to the grocery. So I, I definitely wasn't out, you know, meeting girlfriends for cocktails or commiserating. And I was alone in the house with my two children who at the time were eight and 12. Um, because my ex, even though we were, um, we were separating. Um, so I can't, I can't cry infidelity or anything. We were already in the process of separating. We were already doing mediation before COVID hit. Um, he somehow, uh, met someone and I say somehow, because again, we were locked down <laughs> and he, um, left the house from one day to the next. He kind of lost his mind, had a midlife crisis, whatever you want to call it. 
And, you know, our children knew we were separating, but we had told them we would be staying in the same apartment for now because, um, you know, also because of COVID, but because we live in a very expensive city. And um, that's just the way it had to go. So he, we have two levels and he was going to live downstairs. I was going to live upstairs and it was going to be very fluid. And the kids, um, you know, had it in mind that we'd be in the same house and then suddenly he left. So it was very devastating, very traumatizing. And for the first year, um, I just kept my head down. I'm a freelancer. Uh, it was during, again, a pandemic. I don't do a, an essential job. I'm more of a creative person. So uh, yeah, I was just trying to keep my head above water, keep food on the table, pay my mortgage while, you know, shepherding my kids through virtual learning and, um, you know, drying their tears because they were just so devastated over everything, not just, um, you know, being locked in the house and, and, and not being able to go anywhere or see their friends or go to school, but also because their, their parents were separating and their dad had left suddenly. So for a year, it was just survive. I was a machine. I did what I had to do. I went all day long. And then at night I would just cry and cry and cry because it was the only quiet time. One year was like that. Um, so I'd say my singlehood story really, it's only been about a year um, of, you know, me being able to kind of regroup and think about myself. And I just, I, w- I was, I went in therapy online <laughs> because we couldn't go anywhere. And my kids are in therapy as well. Um, so I've just been working on myself, thinking about, um, you know, my relationship, um, I, I thought my relationship was one thing and, um, it turned out to, you know, I guess I would say it's a person I knew for a long time and he kind of turned out to, to be someone I felt like I didn't know. So just how did that, how did I end up like that? And was it always like that? And, you know, just going through things in my mind and thinking about, who I am now and getting back in touch with myself. And um, one of the things I found really hard, um, aside from on, you know, the dating apps and things like that, which I'll I'll get into, but just after the world opened back up, so many people were reluctant to go back out in the world. I mean, they hadn't gone through divorces or anything, but people were just, you know, still emotionally all rattled. Maybe they'd lost, you know, loved ones or gotten COVID themselves and everybody was going through something. So I was working really hard to like rekindle friendships and get back out in the world, even though what I felt like doing when my kids were with their dad, for example, was just like getting in bed and putting the covers over my head. I pushed myself to get out there and it was, it was hard. I felt like I was getting not so much rejected, but people are busy. People at this time of life are busy. We're all, you know, we're busy with our kids, with our maybe aging parents or, or whatever it is. And, and people have jobs and it was, it's just hard to, to get together with people a lot of times. So I was working really hard on that. And at one point I told my therapist, I feel like I'm planting all of these seeds and I'm working so hard and I'm priming the ground and doing every, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do and nothing is coming up. And um, she told me something that gave me comfort, which is, you know, maybe you're planting tomato seeds in January and you have to wait until the spring. And I think I'm just now maybe coming into the spring. I mean, I don't see all of these <laughs> great things flourishing, but I feel there are glimmers, glimmers of hope on the horizon. Some of my efforts have paid off. You know, not all of the efforts I made have paid off, but some of them are, you know, showing some promise. As for dating, you know, I would say I I approached the dating apps, I don't want to say with enthusiasm, but the last time I was single, I was in my late 20s, so I was you know, I was living that hipster lifestyle in Brooklyn. I was fresh faced. I had a cool job. I was, you know, 15 pounds lighter. <laughs> and I don't know, I remember dating as being fun. And so this was was like a slap in the face to get on these dating apps. And I just feel like in this age range, you know, I feel like my posit- my profile is pretty positive. I mean, it's definitely not negative. It's positive slash neutral or you know, and there's so much negativity. It's just like people at this time of life, they've been knocked down, you know, they've gone through a divorce, maybe they've lost their parents, maybe they're in a bitter 
custody battle or their kids hate them or I don't know just there's a lot of negativity even in the profiles you can see things like you know if you're looking for an ATM machine swipe left you know it's just this bitterness it's and it's um but aside from that there's the ghosting there's the love and I'm a skeptical person so you can love bomb me all day long and I'm not you know I'm not going to start living in a fantasy world but if someone approaches me with like, you seem so great and I can't wait to meet you and when can we meet up? And then when it's time to meet up, they disappear. Like, I just find the apps really negative. And there are a lot of behaviors that are norm. Ghosting is just the norm there. I mean, you, you decide someone's boring and you just never write them back again or whatever. And there are a lot of behaviors that are the norm there that aren't the norm in real life. So I've taken a break from the apps Um because I'm just really working on myself and eventually I would like to have a partner I think I don't know that I want to get remarried or you know now my kids are 10 and 14 and and I don't want to move anybody into the house or you know my ex is still in this very serious relationship and so when the kids are with him they're always with the girlfriend and that's been like a little bumpy and I don't from my side I don't want to bring anything in like that now you know I can't say in three years or four years or five years so that's my singlehood story and I'm just now hitting a stride I feel where singlehood feels like you know I don't want to say a gift that sounds like a cliche but it's time to think about myself work on myself I don't have to answer to anybody else and it's not just this like loneliness and especially with when your partner you know gets into this very serious your ex-partner it makes you think like wow well you know he's having all this fun and and I'm here with the kid, you know, our kids. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm not in that mode anymore. I'm really think, looking at it as a time to work on myself and, and, you know, try to be positive and have hope for the future. So that's my story. And I wish all the best to everyone else out there on a similar journey. <laughs>